In the previous video, we saw the self-attention layer. To get from a self-attention layer to a full-fledged model, we need to repeat it a number of times in a uh, controlled fashion. If we do that, we get what's called a transformer model. And that's what we will be talking about in this video. We'll define a transformer model as any sequence-based model that primarily uses self-attention to propagate information along the time dimension. So we can add some other features and some other types of layers, but the main layer that is responsible for propagating along the time dimension will be the self-attention. We'll limit ourselves to sequence models in this lecture, but actually there are now transformers in other domains as well. For instance, there are image transformers and graph transformers. And the basic idea there is that our input consists of a set of basic units, in the case of images, pixels, in the case of graphs, graph nodes that are connected by some structure. In images, the pixel grid, in graph nodes, the topology of the graph. And the idea of any transformer is that it's uh, a model that primarily uses self-attention to propagate information between these basic units of our instances along the structure that we are given, along the pixel grid or along the graph. But as I said, for this lecture, we'll limit ourselves to sequence models. The main strategy that people tend to use to build transformers is to define a transformer block, which is a set of operations that are uh, wired together in a certain way, and to then repeat that transformer block a number of times. The exact architecture of transformer block differs from model to model, but in most cases it looks uh, something like this. The block takes in an input sequence, the input sequence is fed through a normalization known as layer normalization. Then it's fed through self-attention. Around these two operations, there is a residual connection after which we see a la another layer normalization and a feed-forward layer with another res residual connection around it. And the feed-forward layer here operates with the same parameters on every token of the input sequence uh, in isolation. This means that, as we said before, the only operation that propagates information along the time dimension is the self-attention. The other three operations operate on every input token in isolation. The layer normalization, we can think of simply as doing exactly the same thing as a batch normalization does, except in another direction in the uh, batch tensor. So if we think of our batch tensor as a three tensor with some input features, a batch dimension and a time dimension, then the uh, layer normalization normalizes along only the input features. So each individual vector in our input sequence is treated so that its values in isolation have mean zero and standard deviation one. And you can read the algorithm here, but it's basically the same operations as are used in batch normalization. So now with our transformer block in place, we can start defining transformers. Here's a very simple example of uh, sequence to label transformer. We take some input embeddings, we feed it through a stack of transformer blocks, we get an output sequence, we do some global pooling, and we get a single output vector that we can transform uh, into our output label. And this works the same way for um, all the uh, sequence based tasks that we've seen before sequence to label, label to sequence, and sequence to sequence, with one exception namely the autoregressive model. This is a sequence to sequence task. So a simple stack of transformers blocks will give us our basic sequence-to-sequence -sequence model that we're looking for. But the problem with autoregressive models is that the task is to predict the next token in the sequence. And these transformer blocks have access to the next token in the sequence, so they can simply look ahead in the sequence and copy that to the output. In other words, the problem is that the transformer block is not causal. In order to do autoregressive training with transformer blocks, we need to make the self-attention causal. And this is done very simply by removing the forward connections in the self-attention. And this is known as masking. We proceed as follows. First, we compute the raw attention weights as we did before, simply by taking the dot products of the vectors, input vectors with themselves. But then in this raw attention matrix, before we apply the softmax, we mask out all the values above the diagonal, because these are the values representing forward connections. So wherever the column index is larger than the row index, 
we set the value manually to minus infinity. We mask out by setting to minus infinity because that means that after we apply the softmax operation, these values will become zero. And then with these masked out attention weights, we can simply multiply the input by the weight matrix and get our output matrix without forward connections. So we'll call this a causal transformer block, a transformer block set up as before, but with the self-attention uh, with masked out forward connections. Another problem that we need to deal with is the lack of sequential structure in the self-attention. Obviously, the meaning of a sentence often depends on the exact ordering of the words. Here we have two restaurant reviews using exactly the same words, but meaning the exact opposite. And if we feed this through a simple classification transformer to do, for instance, sentiment classification, what we see is that the output vectors will be the same for both sentences, except in a different order. And since the global pooling at the end just sums all of these together to produce our output label, we get the same output label for both sentences. So what we need to do here in order to allow the self-attention and to allow this transformer block to see the sequential structure of the sequence, we need to break this equivariance. We need to tell the transformer about the uh, structure of the input sequence. And we do so by communicating the position of the input tokens. And we'll look at three ways of doing this. Position embeddings, position encodings, and relative positions. The simplest of these are position embeddings. In position embeddings, just like we um, assigned a embedding vector to every word in our vocabulary, we also assign an embedding vector to every position in our sequence, from one to however long we expect our sequences to be. And then we can just sum these two together for every word in our input sequence. So what we see in this particular input sequence, the word the occurs twice, but they result in different input vectors because in the first case, it is summed with the position embedding for the position one. And in the second occurrence, it is summed with the position embedding for the position uh, four. And we can do this at every block or we can do it just once. This is very easy to implement, but the drawback is that we're basically giving our transformer model a fixed maximum length. If we encounter after training a sequence that is longer than the longest sequence that we encounter during training, then the um, position embeddings for the end of that sequence will not be trained and therefore we cannot expect good performance on such sequences. An approach that generalizes a little better, at least in theory, is that of position encodings. In position encodings, we take the same principle we uh, represent the positions in our sequence by vectors, but here they are not embedding vectors. They are not learned. They are simply fixed constants that we defined beforehand. And the trick here is to define these vectors by a series of functions, one per dimension, uh, that follow a predictable pattern. So here, for instance, we see a, a number of sinusoidal functions. Each one gives us the uh, value for one dimension and to get the position encoding for a particular position, let's say the position five, we simply look at what the values of these functions are for the input five on the x-axis. That gives us a position encoding. We sum that to the embedding vector for the word, and we feed that to the transformer. And the main benefit here is that this pattern continues indefinitely in a predictable way. So in theory, at least, the transformer can learn what the position encoding should be for longer sequences than it has observed during training. So ideally, a transformer would generalize a little bit better to longer sequences if position encodings are used. The drawback is that it's a little bit more difficult to implement and there are a bit more ad hoc choices to make in exactly which position uh, encodings you use. Finally, we'll look at relative positions. The idea behind relative positions is that when we're producing a particular output, for instance, the output for the word the in this case, what matters is not so much the absolute positions of the surrounding words, but how far they are from the current word, so the relative positions. The problem here is that if we implement this naively, we're applying different position vectors to every input depending on which output we're computing. So we need to be a little bit clever here about how we implement this efficiently. And that starts by opening up the self-attention operation. So that looks like this. The raw self-attention weight 
consists of the dot product between a query vector and a key vector. And we've moved the scaling constant, the square root of d, to the left so we can focus on the dot product in isolation. If we fill in the definition of this query vector and this key vector, we see that it's just a Q matrix multiplied by a input xi and a K matrix multiplied by input xj. And we're assuming here that we're applying um, key query and value transforms without biases. We move the transpose inside the brackets and we see that we basically still have a dot product except that there's this uh, square matrix Q times K, QT times K in the middle. And now we can fill in the definition of these X vectors in terms of their um, word embedding and their position embedding. We stick with uh, absolute position embeddings for now. And we see that both of these X's are just the sum of a word embedding and a position embedding. The word embedding is VW and the position embedding is VP. If we multiply out the brackets of this last expression, we get a sum of four terms. These are as follows. The dot product of the ith word embedding with the jth word embedding with this QT matrix, QK matrix in the middle. The dot product of the ith word embedding with the jth position embedding. The dot product of the ith position embedding with the jth word embedding and the dot product of the two position embeddings. And the idea of relative positions is to uh, take this formulation of the raw weight and rephrase it as follows. The first term we keep as is, with the only difference being that we split up the K matrix into two different ones. So we have one K matrix that we use for the word embeddings and a separate K matrix that we use for the position embeddings. So for the second term, everything is the same, except that the K matrix becomes a different K matrix that we use for the position embeddings and we replace the J position embedding with the relative position embedding I minus J. So VP is now a uh, vector that depends both on I and on J. Now for the third and fourth term, we can take a look at these uh, two leftmost factors in the expression VIP times Q. Now that's basically just the position embedding for the query and the position of the query doesn't change if we're computing the output for i, the position of the query is always the same. So we don't need to recompute this always, we can just replace it by a trainable constant uh, vector a and the same for the fourth term which we replace by a trainable constant vector b. So this is our new expression for the raw weights. We still have a problem to solve because in the second and fourth terms, we still have these position embeddings that are dependent both on i and on j. So if we do this naively, we need a quadratic number of position embeddings for all combinations of i and j. So we need to avoid that somehow. So we'll look a little bit closer at the second term and the logic for the fourth term is exactly the same. Now, even though the this position uh, vector is dependent on both i and j, we've indexed it by the value i minus j. And there are only so many values that that expression can take. In the minimal case, uh, i is as small as possible, so 1, and j is as large as possible, l. So the minimal case is uh, minus l minus 1. And likewise, the maximal case is l minus 1. So these are all the relative positions that we could possibly need embedding vectors for. We stick them all in the matrix, the matrix would look like this. So we'll call that matrix VP. And if we multiply that matrix by KP, we get a matrix called U, containing all the um, vectors that we need to represent these rightmost two uh, factors in our expression. And note that these could be either encodings or embeddings. We can make this a uh, large learnable matrix, or we can fill this with these uh, constant values defined by some set of sinusoidals, for instance. Going back to our expression, we can collapse the leftmost two factors in the expression back to a vector qi, and we want to multiply this by one of the columns in our u matrix, which is indexed by this expression, i minus j plus l minus 1. So to vectorize, what we can do is we can 
stack all these qi vectors together in one matrix and multiply it by this entire u matrix. What we see then is that the values that we're actually interested in form this kind of staircase pattern. Because for the first row, where i is 1, all the j values that we are interested in are bigger than i. So all of the uh, u values that we're interested in are in the left half of the matrix. And for every increase in i, the range of values that we're interested in moves one step to the right. So all we need to do is compute this matrix and slice out these orange parts and discard the white parts. In order to do that in a, an efficient way, what we can do is flatten the matrix. So with the operation view minus one, we scan row by row by row into a large vector with L times two L minus one elements. If we then pad QU with L additional zeros, we get a long vector of size two times L times L. And what you can see, if you look at the number of white cells between one orange bar and the next, you see that crossing the ends of the uh, rows in this matrix, there's always exactly L of them. So if we reshape the matrix like this, we see that all of these bars align neatly and we get a matrix that is one half orange and one half white. And from this matrix, we can very easily slice out the values that we need. So we had to jump through some hoops, but this gives us our relative position encoding. And the only price we pay is that we are computing half of these uh, attention weights, the white part of this matrix that we don't need. So to restate, we have position embeddings, which are easy to implement, flexible, but don't offer any generalization between the observed sequence length during training. Position encodings, which are slightly harder, but offer the possibility at least of a little bit more generalization. And then relative positions, which we can uh, use with both embeddings and encodings, but they must be implemented by adapting the self-attention itself. So they're not as easy as just summing a bunch of vectors to our input vectors. So that brings us from the basic self-attention operation to the larger transformer models by the simple steps of trans defining a transformer block, masking the self-attention if we have to happen to need a causal model, stacking a bunch of these transformer blocks together, and adding positional information as needed. In the next video, we'll look at some famous transformers, or in other words, we'll look at the details of how these principles have been used in practice to train some very big and some very powerful models.